uh, do a two-week series starting today, a two-week series starting today, and uh, Ben asked me to talk on this topic. It's related to my doctoral studies topic from a few years ago, uh, but we're calling this two-week series Biblical Sexuality, Engaging LD- LGBTQ ideology, uh, ideology with Truth and Grace. So today's going to be part one. We're going to talk specifically about um, same-sex attraction and homosexuality. Um, n- next week, we're going to talk about the, the gender question, transgenderism, um, and gender ideology. And so you know these are controversial sensitive topics in the culture. So the goal today will be to handle these with a lot of grace and kindness. I want to be very sensitive and tender and handle these topics well. The church has made mistakes in the past um, relating to topics like this, so I want to say it well. Um, Also, today's and next week's topic topic is not political at all. It's personal. Because we're going to be talking about the lives of people and the ideas of people we know personally and we care about deeply. Uh, but the question, why even do an impact training on these topics? It's supposed to be ministry training or evangelism training. Well, how often do topics of sexuality and gender come up in spiritual conversations? If you're talking to a non-Christian friend about spiritual things, how often do these questions come up? Pretty often, people want to know, is Christianity anti-gay people? Is Christianity transphobic? Is Christianity anti-women? And so, if we want to be good ambassadors for the gospel, we need to have good answers for those kind of questions. So that'll be what we're going to dive into. So I'm going to offer a prayer and ask God to give us a lot of grace and help us during this time. Also, questions are going to be welcome throughout. Um, I've done... I've done a pretty deep dive in my doctoral work on these topics, but this will be a pretty high-level overview, so if you want me to go deeper, feel free to just ask a question, and we'll do questions at the end for as much time as we have left, but we'll move pretty fast. Let's let's, uh, jump in and pray. Father, I pray you'd help us to see the world, especially this issue, in light of you, your truth, your love for all mankind your desire for every person to come to a knowledge of you, saving faith in Jesus Christ. God, we also know that there are ideas that are capturing minds and pointing them away from truth and not towards truth. So help us to think well, to think Christianly, to think wisely about these sensitive topics. And God, may we never, as we talk about these topics, get anger in our hearts, but help us to have love and mercy in our hearts for all of our fellow mankind. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So you should have a handout. If you don't, you can wave your hand and somebody will bring you one, but uh, we're going to jump in. The first slide, Sean McDowell says, the question this generation is asking isn't, is Christianity true? They're asking, is it good? Is it good? When I was a college student, it's really normal when I, we talk to non-Christians, all of their questions were about what you call evidential apologetics. Can I trust the Bible? Did Jesus really raise from the dead? Did miracles actually happen? Those were the big questions. Well, now when we go out on campus and talk to students, questions about morality are bigger questions. Can, it, can, how can God allow evil to happen? Is Christianity anti-women, anti-gay, anti-trans? These are the questions people are really struggling with. And in a ministry like ours, we see a lot of people come to Christ. New believers sometimes have a lot of baggage around these topics, a lot of brokenness. And if we're honest, it's not just LGBT people who are broken. We're all broken people. Every one of us has some kind of brokenness around our identity or our sexuality. And so this isn't pointing fingers at them. This is saying we need to know God's truth for our own souls. And even though culture is confused, my assumption is some of you claim some of you follow Jesus, but you're still confused about these topics too. You're not confident about what scripture says. So, let's jump in. Next slide says powerful forces indoctrinate Gen Z, that's your generation, with dangerous ideology. The apostle Paul in Colossians 2:8 
It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental forces of this world rather than on Christ. If you unpack that verse, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. In every generation, there's an ideology that's false. And it, that ideology seeks to capture the minds of people and move them away from the truth. So it's a hollow and deceptive philosophy. Well, where do those ideas come from? Well, the verse says it come, they come from two places. One is those ideologies come from human tradition. Because in reality, we're sinful people and we can come up with terrible ideas on our own. We don't need any help. But those ideologies also come from the elemental spiritual forces. Do you know what the Apostle Paul means when he says elemental spiritual forces? He uses it several times in his books. What does he mean? He's talking about Satan and demons. And he said, here's what he says if you summarize that verse. In every generation, there's a set of ideas that captures people's minds. False ideas that captures people's minds. And the source of those ideas are sinful humans and Satan himself. Well, in your generation, what ideology, more than LGBT ideology, is seductive in capturing people's minds and keeping them from accepting Christian truth? So this is a spiritual battle. This is, the, this is in some ways the front line of a battle to win people over to see the beauty of God's truth. A um, few disclaimers. Um, I've been in BSM here 21 years, and we've had... I was going to say dozens, but probably scores and scores of students who found themselves to be same-sex attracted, who found themselves to have brokenness in the area of orientation and attraction. We've had staff, multiple staff, who've wrestled with their own attractions in this way. Um, a few walk away from Jesus because they get seduced by the ideas, but very, very many honor Christ with their lives. They say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to live a life that honors him in every way. And whatever that means, I'm willing to do it. And it's beautiful to watch people who have that experience and make that decision. Absolutely, another caveat, we reject as Christians bullying, homophobia. Christ loves, God loves people. God loves all people. And as Christians, we need to strive to do the same. God loves straight people. He loves gay people. He loves all people because we're all sinners. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get into some definitions in a minute. The way most people will use homophobia, the, the classic definition is animus, which means hostility, which means degradation, insults, anger toward... The definitions have been changed in the modern world to mean unless you fully affirm all of my identity and my decisions, then you're homophobic. So uh, I use the first definition, not the second definition. So we reject homophobia in the sense that we can harbor no malice towards people who have same-sex attraction, if that answers your question. Um, God didn't give us the Bible to beat people with it, but to share good news from it. Um, and so I'm going to assume some of you aren't convinced that the Christian faith must reject same-sex sexuality, same-sex behavior. And so today we're going to limit our discussion to what the church teaches for Christians. We're not, gonna, we're not talking today about politics. We're not talking about what the government ought to do. We're not talking about how you ought to vote. That can be another conversation for another time. But regardless of where we, regardless of even if we're not talking about politics, the culture's still going to call what we do, to Millie's question, still going to call what we're going to espouse today homophobia. So the, why are these issues such heated issues? Because in American society, sexuality has become ultimate identity for people. People have made their sexuality, their gender identity, their orientation into their core, most fundamental, most important attribute of who they are. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this statistic, 39% of Generation Z, your generation, so think age 10 up to about age 25, 
that's Gen Z, 39% identifies as LGBTQ. 39%, 4 in 10 of your generation identifies as LGBTQ. Does that number sound reasonable or does that surprise you? Does that sound high or does that sound normal? Does that sound low? Sounds high, okay. It's funny, I, I, Teresa and I were with a group of students in Berkeley, California at UC Berkeley this summer. And I put that statistic on the screen and they're like, that seems a little low, honestly. It's interesting that number's at higher on the coasts. It's higher in more progressive areas, a little lower in the middle. Um, next week, we'll dig deeper into that number because what, what a lot of your friends mean when they say they're queer is not what queer meant 20 years ago. The definitions have changed, so the percentage has gone up. We'll talk about that next week. But regardless, for your generation, this is celebrated. So some ways it's celebrated, the U.S. government, you know, officially Obergefell versus Hodges, Supreme Court decision, legalized gay marriage nationwide several years ago, 2018. The White House in, uh, in the current administration in June flies the pride flag. Interestingly, on equal level with the American flag, which breaks flag code, you're not supposed to fly a flag on the same level, but the White House did that this year. Um, corporations, and especially during the month of June, during Pride Month, market aggressively. Education takes for granted full LGBT acceptance. There's a, there's a narrative that says that LGBT people are an oppressed minority when really... They're celebrated at the highest levels of culture, Hollywood, government, entertainment, um, the education system, and more and more churches are embracing LGBT ideology. Um, there's a, we talk about definitions in a second, but they're affirming churches who say that queer identities are perfectly fine for Christians to have. We're going to tackle that this week and next week. Um, as an example, you may have seen this news story, but the Dove Awards are the Christian movie, Music Awards. Ben, knows, ben saw this story last week. They, uh, they, they were held last week, and a very famous Christian artist, Derek Webb, formerly of Cademan's Call, attended the Dove Awards. He's won a couple Dove Awards, attended, uh, but he wore, he wore a dress, he wore black nail polish, and he brought as his plus one guest the Christian drag queen, Flamey Grant. You see this story? So there are Christians who are claiming the name of Jesus but are embracing the, the most extreme of LGBT ideologies. Derek Webb is one. So pastorally, especially since 2016, you know, America got very polarized politically in 2016. There was an election. Then COVID happened four years later, even more polarized. It's, we're just on that trajectory. I've watched a number of former strong BSM leaders who've graduated and moved on into adulthood who got repulsed by right-wing politics and embraced and galvanized by left-wing politics, deconstructing their faith, displaying rainbow flags on their social media, branding themselves allies, and a good number of them abandoning Jesus. So this topic and having confidence as a Christian on these topics really is a big deal. See, Christianity is a way of life. It's not just a set of ideas. We, we believe in Jesus and Jesus saves us. When we come to Jesus, we adopt the ways of Jesus. We commit not just to Jesus as my Savior, but to Jesus as Lord. One of my favorite topics to research is the early church. Because the early church, against all odds, exploded. Some of the reasons it exploded were the Holy Spirit just did a unique thing. It was beautiful. It exploded because ordinary Christians, we didn't depend on trained pastors to spread the gospel. Ordinary Christians spread the gospel, which is why I'm so proud of you guys, because you're ordinary Christians spreading the gospel, doing it old school style. But one reason the early church exploded if you read history, is because of its ethics, its sexual ethics. See, the world, the Roman world, had utter anarchy around sexual, sexuality. And in Christ, 
the ethics of Christians were revolutionary. They were beautiful. Christian husbands didn't use prostitutes. They didn't abuse their wives. Christian fathers didn't kill their infants if they didn't like them. Christian soldiers didn't assault women. And people streamed into the church because they looked and said the way the church is doing it is better than the way the world's doing it. One thing you'll notice if you'll look at your, the, the numbers around your generation, the acceptance of every identity under the sun is rising. The story culture tells is we need to become more accepting because living in an intolerant society creates stress for LGBT people. Yet society's never been more accepting than ever, and mental health, comes have nev- mental health outcomes have never been lower than they are now. The worst mental al- health outcomes in your generation are among LGBT people, even though governments, education, Hollywood celebrates them. So at some point, we have to have some courage to say the, the things you've bought into aren't working. They're not like salve for your soul. They don't heal you. They don't make you better. Christ can do that, not what the culture says. Um, The Apostle Paul gets to this. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, he makes the point, our sexuality is profoundly important to our spirituality. So I'm asking you a question. Have you heard the saying, true or false, this saying? All sin is the same in God's eyes, true or false. I've heard preachers say that my whole life. All sin is the same in God's eyes. True or false? Got some false crowds. Anybody say true? I'm in the truth. Okay, I got a, got a few trues. Any, who says false? Well, it's, it's true, and it's false. It's true. Hear me out. All sin shows that I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. All sin shows me that I'm separated from God. But it's false because not all sin affects my soul or my life the same way. See, I actually believe the wrath of God, the anger of God, burns hotter at the child abuser than at the child who tells a white lie. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, sexual sin can affect your soul more profoundly than some other sins. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? (laughs) You dropped a great. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, was given to you by God. You don't belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. See, there are people today who criticize what in my generation was called purity culture. And some of that criticism was right. This idea that if you sinned sexually, you were damaged goods from then on. And they said purity culture heaped shame on people who needed grace. And that's a fair criticism of the way some people talked about sexuality. Here's the thing, though. We don't need purity culture to make us feel shameful when we do shameful things, to make us feel shame, ashamed. When we do. There are guys who are not Christians that are out there who are addicted to pornography, and they feel horrible about it because deep down they know they're doing a shameful thing. They didn't, they don't, culture's not telling them it's shameful, but they know in their soul that it's shameful. See, sec, sexual sin puts this burden of sin and shame on shoulders of people and it's, all, it, it's fun for me to watch guys and girls, but I work with guys more, who, you know, the average age to first exposure pornography is 10 years old now. It's so young. You don't have a prayer, like, you don't even know what it is when you see it. So I just assume most of you have had an experience with it, and it's been, and it, and it's been seductive. It's pulled you in. But there's a difference in posture with guys who are struggling with it all the time, and they feel the weight of the shame of it on them, and then guys who fought and struggled and make the hard decisions and given the burden to Jesus, and they've put up boundaries, and they've walked in freedom, and their countenance is just different. 
because the shame is lifted. Sexual sin affects you more profoundly. It, it also, all through Scripture, marriage and sex is a picture of God's love for His people. In the Old Testament, the love of Yahweh for Israel is compared to a husband and a wife. In the New Testament, the love of Christ for the church is compared to a husband and a wife. And when we as Christians twist and mar our sexuality, it twists and mars the picture of God we send to the world. So it's important that we take these issues seriously. Not just to tell, preach to them, but to preach to ourselves. So, um, next slide. Where do we start? The first page of the Bible is surprisingly relevant to all the controversies, all these controversies. The first page of the Bible talks about human, humanity's purpose, our purpose for existing. And it does it with an image that the Genesis chapter 1 calls the image of God. It says every human is made in the image of God. And if you read Genesis 1, 27, 28, the image of God defines our purpose. It establishes our dignity. It governs our sexuality. So if you know the passage, God created mankind in his own image, the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, rule over it, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the air, rule over every living creature that moves on the ground. On page one of the Bible, the scripture tells you why you're on earth. God gives you a purpose. And sometimes, we've, sometimes we're all, we're kind of mushy about purpose. We're like, oh, I'm so grateful God has a purpose for my life. And are like, well, what is that purpose? I have no idea. Genesis 1 tells us, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. You know what that means? It actually means just be a productive member of society. Live in a way that blesses other people. Live in a way that causes humanity to flourish. Build families, build cultures, build societies so that other people can have the blessings of God in their life. That's part of the image of God. The second thing it does is it establishes our dignity. See, there were other ancient cultures that had the image of God. They said there are people who are made in the image of God. But you know who those people were? They said our king is the image of God. Maybe the priests in our temple are the image of God, but everybody else, they're just slaves and servants of the gods. They're not made in the image of God. Christianity shows up and says, uh-uh. The king of Israel and the enemies of Israel are made in the image of God. The slave owner and the slave are made in the image of God. So the way a king treats his subjects, the way a captor treats his enemies, the way a slave owner treats his servants is informed by the fact that they have God's stamp on them and they have dignity. Part of what that means is gay people are made in the image of God and we have to treat them as image bearers of God. Trans people are made in the image of God. Any attitude in the church that says otherwise is against the truth of God. So um, the third thing the image teaches is it governs our sexuality. So right there in the, in the description of the image of God is reproduction and gender. Start families, men and women, male and female, bear children. So God's design for marriage, God's design for sexuality is implied right there in our purpose, in our created purpose. So uh, let's see, next slide. had a girl, it was about a year and a half ago, asked me the question when I was working through how I would give good answers to these questions. She, she said, okay, I got a friend, close friend. We've started to talk about spiritual things, and I really want to share the gospel with her more boldly than I have, but she's gay, and I know it's going to come up as soon as I initiate it. So how do I talk to my gay friend about Christ? So I want to give you a tip for doing that, and then we're going to look at some, we're going to do some kind of nuanced stuff about that topic, but how do I talk to my gay friend about Christ? Well, here's the big idea. We want people to be saved, not straight. Once they come to Christ, Christ can be their Lord and can deal with them about lifestyle, but where our job is to point people to Jesus, not morality. We make the issue about identity, not orientation. We point people to Jesus pure and simple. 
So here's some good news. When you look at America and the things that divide us, what are the things that are like the most controversial in America? Like if you're going to get a protest, what are people going to protest over right now? Okay, abortion. So that's like, that has, that has to do with sexuality in some ways. What else? Yeah, race. Uh, is, is, are, are, is racial tension a real thing in our society right now? Have there been any protests around racial, racial issues in America since 2020? It's a big deal, right? So there's race. What about, what about social status? Money. Rich and poor. Occupy Wall Street. The haves and have-nots. The 1% and the 99%. These are issues that people get fired up about. And then there's gender and sexuality, right? Well, guess what, they, guess what divided people in the early church? Race. Social status, gender, and sexuality. Even in the church, the first century church, it was race, social status, gender, and sexuality. It was different because race for them in the early church was um, race for them was Jew and Gentile. Social status for them was master and servant. In fact, one of the things that got Christians persecuted was servants and masters worshiped together in the same church. And the Romans said, that defies the social order. That shouldn't happen. We should keep people, servants, separated from masters. And the Christians said, no, we're brothers. We worship together. And the Romans hated them for that. And then gender is a patriarchal society. It was an infanticide culture. These are controversial. And the Apostle Paul says, but here's the solution to the things that divide you in the early church. Christ. Getting your full, whole identity from Jesus first. And in the book of Galatians, this was a church divided over racial issues. Jew and Gentile divide. Here's what he said. And I want you to get the mental picture. He said, so in Christ, you are all children of God. Now, the idea of being a child of God means your whole identity changes. When you're adopted into a family, your last name changes and your inheritance changes. So who you are in the world changes. You have a new identity. You're children of God through faith. For all of you who were, get the visual, baptized into Christ, you're immersed in Christ, you're covered with Christ, have now clothed yourselves with Christ. So you're wrapped in Jesus. Everything about us, if we're Christians, we say, yes, I'm still a woman. Yes, I'm still a man. Yes, I'm still a student. Those things don't change. But at the core of who I am, the most important thing I am is I'm his. Our identity changes. And he says, for there is neither race, Jew or Gentile, neither social status, slave or free, neither gender, male or female. You're all one in Christ if you belong to Christ then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if somebody said, how do I talk to my gay friend about Christ? One answer is, you say something like, look, my relationship with God is the most important thing to me. It gives me hope, gives me peace, structures how I live my life, and I want you to know the same joy. I want you to know the same. And so don't get your ultimate identity from your sexuality, from your gender identity, from your politics, from anything else. What I pray for you is that you would know what it is to surrender yourself to Jesus. So that's one way that we shift the conversation from nuanced questions of morality to saying really ultimately it's a question of loyalty and allegiance to Jesus. Now if somebody's in a lifestyle and they come to Jesus, he's going to work on it. It's not just LGBT people who have to change. It's us who have to change. Every day I run up against God's truth and I have to say no to some of my desires and yes to him. So uh, in our last bit of time together, we're going to talk through the debate within the church about LGBT acceptance. Specifically, we'll talk about same-sex marriage because there are some Christians who say the church should embrace same-sex marriage. So quick glossary of terms. Um, Homosexual is an individual, I took that off, same-sex attracted is a term that it's a matter-of-fact term for those who experience attraction to the same sex, fair? So if somebody says they're gay, they're same-sex attracted, they say they're bi, they're same-sex attracted. 
um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, these tend to be the preferred terms by people who've accepted as their core identity their sexuality. See, there's a lot of Christians who experience same-sex attraction, but they say it doesn't define me. So they'll say, I experience same-sex attraction, but who I am is a Christian. And so they're open about their attractions, but they don't like terms that the culture uses as identity terms. Now, there's a, there's a lively debate over what, whether a same-sex attracted Christian can use the term gay. I'm not getting into that conversation today, and I think there's people who I trust on both sides who make a good argument either way. But that's the, th- those are terms, and then there's two views that we'll, we'll compare. One is called the affirming view. Now, the affirming view says that churches and Christians, uh, these are people, who, churches and Christians who believe the church should affirm even celebrate same-sex marriage unions. Now, there are churches, there's a good number of churches who've done that, a lot of mainline denominations. The Episcopal Church has fully embraced this, Presbyterian Church USA, the Disciples of Christ, which is like TCU, um, their denomination has. Um, A number are splitting over it. The United Methodist Church is in the process of a split into United and Global Methodists over this area. Um, The Reformed Church of America is in the middle of splitting, interestingly. Southern Baptists have kind of established themselves on the other side. Uh, Interestingly, every church that has become affirming is shrinking drastically. And one of the arguments they make is culture's changing, we have to change, or our church will die. And just as a matter of observations, the churches that have changed are shrinking and dying. Um, You can ask me in Q&A why that is, and I'll tell you, but in a minute... The second view is the historic view. Some people will call this the non-affirming view or the traditional view or the conservative view. This really is the view of all Christians through all of time for all 2,000 years of the church, for all 4,000 years of Judeo-Christian religion. This has been the view. It's actually the view of every society worldwide, Christian and non, until about 75 years ago. So we'll call it the historic view. This is, these are those who hold that lifelong heterosexual opposite sex marriage is the only legitimate outlet for sexual contact. Um, often people in this camp prefer SSA over gay. Um, and as Christians in this, uh, Christians with this position make a distinction between identity and practice. See, in the historic view, we're happy to say we've got brothers and sisters who experience same-sex attraction. The Bible doesn't condemn them. What the Bible condemns is actions. The Bible condemns acting. It's just like I have temptations every day. I'm, I'm tempted to be jealous. I'm tempted to be petty. I'm tempted to gossip. I say no to those urges. Every one of us has temptations or orient, an orientation that doesn't honor God. Um, and so the historic view draws a distinction between impulses and actions, and it's scripture condemns actions, not impulses. So uh, let's answer the next question. Can a person be gay and be Christian? What do you say? Can a person be gay and be Christian? Oh, thank you. Good good answer. (laughs) And the answer is yes, depending on what you mean. So If you mean, can a person be same-sex attracted and follow Jesus wholeheartedly? Absolutely. I have friends who have that experience. And I would say, in some ways, they've modeled Christianity for me in a way that I'm like, I want to be them when I grow up because they're living a very honorable life before Christ. But if you mean, my ultimate identity is my sexuality. I'm going to follow my urges and my impulses before I follow Jesus. You can't be a Christian and say my ultimate loyalty is to my sexuality, not to Jesus. If that's what you say, you can't be a Christian, because a Christian is somebody who says, Jesus is Lord. So it depends on what you mean. So a modest goal for our next few points are to answer the question, should the church embrace same-sex marriage for Christians? This is not about government policy, what ought to be legal. This is about what the church ought to do, what the Scripture says about Christians. Um, 
So here's a three-step argument, three-step argument for the historic view around same-sex sexual relationships, a three-step argument for traditional, historic, biblical marriage. And these are this basically the way Preston Sprinkle in his book, People to be Loved, he says it in a similar way. I've, I've paraphrased it, but this is, this is the way he phrases it. I really like the way he does it. So step number one, anytime the Bible describes marriage, it's always a lifelong union of a man and a woman. Marriage always has a biological sex component. It's always man and woman. Procreation is always part of its intention when it's described in Scripture. See, this is a positive way to start. One thing that the, one mistake the church has made is to start with negative verses when really we ought to start with God's good design, His purpose for marriage. And when marriage describes its purpose, we already did Genesis 1, and 28. The image of God on its very first page, the Bible affirms complementing nature, the complementing nature of gender. Genesis 2, the Lord made the woman from the rib he had taken from the man. He brought her to the man. The man sings a, ha- a song that rhymes in Hebrew, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She's called woman because she came from man. Then God describes the first marriage. This is why a man leaves his father and mother. He grows up. He's united with his wife, that's marriage, and they become one flesh, that's a physical and a spiritual union. They're naked and unashamed, meaning it's a good, it's not a shameful thing, it's a good thing. So in Genesis 2, marriage, man-woman marriage is a good thing, and it's God's original design. One thing affirming Christians will say is Jesus never taught about homosexuality, so the church shouldn't either. Jesus never addressed it, so he must have approved of it. That's one of the arguments. Well, here's what I would say about that. What Jesus did do is reaffirm the Old Testament. In Matthew 19, the Pharisees, they they were in a debate. They had an internal debate over when a man could divorce his wife. And some of them said he has to have a good reason And other of them said, no, he can just do it on a whim anytime he wants. Patriarchal society, right? And they're like, Jesus, whose side are you on? You've got this reputation as a teacher. Whose side are you on? Jesus puts him in his place like he had a way of doing. And he said, haven't you read? Like he's telling these Bible experts, you haven't even read the Bible. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made the male and female. He quotes Genesis 1. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife, two become one. That's Genesis 2. So he quotes page 1 and 2. Then he summarizes them, so they're no longer two, but one. And then he takes what the Old Testament said, and he doesn't cancel it. He amplifies it. He magnifies it. He makes it even stricter. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, no one can separate. In my West Texas vernacular, we'd say, God made marriage a man-woman institution. Ain't none of y'all got any business changing it. That's how Jesus says it. One way of thinking about it is back back in my olden days, you go to a restaurant and the cash register would have a sign that said cash only. It established a standard for payment. You didn't then have to say, do you take credit card? We've got a standard. Do you take money orders? We've got a standard. Do you take debit? Do you take bitcoins? When a standard's established, you don't then have to come up with a list of 35 exceptions and lay them out too. There's a standard, and that's what's acceptable. And God says, here's what marriage is. You know, and if he said, here's 30 things that it's not, we're perverted. We'd come up with the 31st thing and say, well, you didn't mention this one. So he says, here's the standard. Anything that isn't this, which means as Christians, we've got to be against divorce. We've got to take divorce serious. We've got to take... Sex before marriage series. We've got to take cheating, adultery within marriage series. So we've got to take spousal abuse very seriously. Because God set a standard, this beautiful man-woman union that brings glory to God and good to the world. Got to take it seriously. Slide number two. Anytime the Bible speaks of same-sex sexual activity, it clearly condemns it. Now, affirming Christians call these the clobber passages. They don't like these passages. They say these are just 
products of an ancient barbaric world. They're, they're taken out of context. They, they're describing something that happened then but isn't what we call gay marriage today. So they say there's some, there's some context around each one of these, so you really shouldn't use them. Um, but regardless of whether the, those passages have to be taken in context or not, the statement's still true. The five times the Bible describes same-sex sexuality, it condemns it. Now, if you're interested in what the five are, there's five explicit mentions. One is Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, where it just simply says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. It's detestable. Um, Leviticus 20 says essentially the same thing, um, but uh, amplifies it to women as well. Romans 1, 26 to 27. Because of this, God gave them over, but, and the this is rebellion against God. Because we all turn our backs on God. It says, God just says, if you want to go your own way, I'll let you go your own way. And here's what we did when we went our own way. One thing some people did is women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Men abandoned relations with women, were inflamed with lust for one another. So it describes homosexual actions in Romans 1. 1 Timothy 1.9 condemns, the Apostle Paul condemns those practicing homosexuality. Um, one of the points affirming Christians will try to make is they'll say in 1 Timothy 1, the word used for homosexuality was not in any Bible until 1965 or something. The word homosexual is not in any Bible. Well, literally the word is men who sleep with other men. It just happened to be translated literally in the King James and translated as that word in subsequent Bibles. So it's not as if the idea wasn't there. It's just that word. So it's kind of a disingenuous argument that affirming Christians make. The word's been there since Paul wrote it. And then the last one, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then they list kind categories of wrongdoers, some of which, if we're good legalistic people, we're like, yeah, those people are bad, but if we keep reading the list, we're like, oh, crud, he's describing me too. Slanderers, swindlers, greedy. I've been a little greedy. But one of the categories, he says, is men, adulterers and men who have sex with men. It's the same word that, Paul, that he used in 1 Timothy. Here's what's interesting about this phrase is he says, these people won't make it into the kingdom of God. What's interesting about the way he phrases it here is he uses a verb tense that implies ongoing, non-stop action. He's not describing somebody who had an orientation. He's not describing somebody who had a past. Thank goodness, because I have a past. We all have a past. He's describing somebody who persistently, consistently, for their whole life says, I reject God's way for me and I give myself to something, anything else. So it's a persistent and lifelong commitment to a, to a lifestyle of rebellion. Uh, here's a question that comes up a lot. And if you have same-sex attracted Christian friends, ask them this question. Ask them their opinion on this question. You'll get a really interesting answer. Are some people born gay? Where did they choose it? What does Lady Gaga say? I was born this way, right? Are people born gay or do they choose it? Well, the answer is, anybody have a guess? Neither. You'll never meet a same-sex attracted person who said, you know, I was 14 and I had a decision to make. Do I like boys or do I like girls? It wasn't a decision. The research also says it's not genetic, it's not inborn. It's complicated. Nature and nurture, when you take your biology and your psychology class, every aspect of human existence, of human personality, is a complex weaving. Like, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert, extrovert. Were you born an introvert or were you made an introvert? Well, it's nature and nurture working together. And anything as complicated as who I'm attracted to is usually a complicated interweaving of nature and nurture. And so Christians who insist it's a choice should back off. And activists who insist 
It's pure genetic. We're born this way. We have no choice in the matter. And if you do anything but act according to your desires, you're being disloyal to you and untrue to yourself. They need to back off too. Because it's more complicated on both sides than that. Um, and then slide number three, point number three. Yeah, yeah. Point number three, there is a complete 2,000-year consensus among Christians separated by time, geography, culture, eth- and ethnicity on the first two points. The traditional view is the ancient Christian historic view. Now, being historical, being the view of the church all through time doesn't make it true necessarily, but we should take the wisdom of centuries and centuries of Christian thought seriously. Every continent, every denomination, in every century, it's only been in liter- in the historically speaking in the last 5 minutes since the sexual revolution in the 1960s, that any Christians have said we need to change the church's view on sexuality. That's interesting. It's only been since Western culture exploded in the sexual revolution that the church has said maybe we ought to re-examine too. So is the church following scripture or is the affirming church is following a cultural movement? It's an interesting question. Um, Catholics... Orthodox, Pentecostal, Baptist, black churches, brown churches, white churches, rich churches, poor churches. Here's an interesting part of affirming Christianity is it really is only Western, European, think European and American churches, Western churches, predominantly overwhelmingly white churches, rich churches, educated churches, who are affirming. See, the African church isn't affirming. The Latin American church isn't affirming. The Asian church isn't affirming. But in a lot of these denominations, they have Western churches with a lot of money, and they have African branches of their church. This is happening with the Anglicans and Episcopals right now because the money is controlled by Europe, but there's desperate human need in Africa, children's homes, feeding programs, education, and so Western countries are putting pressure on Christians in Latin and at, in the global South to change their doctrine to match Western doctrine. It's colonialism. It's us saying to them, you're backwards, you're savages, you're behind the times, you're following ancient doctrines, we're enlightened, we know what truth is. You need to change your doctrine to be like us if you want our help. It's ideological, colonial. It's gross. When we say we hold the historic view, you know, we have brothers and sisters who are in the persecuted church in Iran. They all hold to the historic view. There is no affirming Christianity in the persecuted church in China. There's no uh, uh, revival. The most, the, the hottest revival on earth is in sub-Saharan Africa among Pentecostals right now. They're, they hold the historic view. So when we say we hold the historic view, we're not standing against some backward savage view. We're standing with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the developing world and in the persecuted church. So that that emboldens me to say, you know, I don't want to give in on this topic because I want to be in solidarity with my brothers and sisters. Um, But aren't there churches that believe in gay marriage? Yes. Next slide. So what are the affirming arguments for same-sex sexuality? I'll mention the two most, the two most common arguments, and I'll, I'll tell you why I don't find them convincing. The first is called the new knowledge argument. The idea here is that what they knew in the Bible times is different than what we know now. They didn't know anything about loving, same status. See, they would say in Bible times, same-sex relationships were powerful masters having sex with slaves or older men having sex with boys. So the Bible condemned that, but the, they, they didn't know anything about lifelong, loving, monogamous, same-sex relationships. Those didn't exist in the, mo- in the ancient world. They would say the Bible, what the Bible describes is exploitation. They'd say the homosexuality they knew involved powerful forcing sex on vulnerable people. The problem with that is history. 
the Romans knew about everything. They did stuff that made us blush. They had, there's strong evidence that they had same-sex male lifelong partnership, same-sex female lifelong partnership, same status. And so when Paul writes Romans and condemns it, he's writing knowing that context. Um, Archaeological evidence shows that. Even affirming scholars who are New Testament scholars acknowledge that's true. A good example of that, Jimmy, Jimmy Creech is a, Dr. Jimmy Creech is a United Methodist scholar. He's been part of the controversy that's splitting their denomination right now. And he says, quote, at the heart of the claim that the Bible is clear, that homosexuality is forbidden by God, is poor <coughs> biblical scholarship and a cultural bias to read the Bible. The Bible says nothing about homosexuality as an innate dimension of human personality. Sexual orientation in Bible time was not understood during Bible times. The problem is, the more we learn about Bible times, the more we know, yet they, they knew what we know. They weren't backwards. They were just as smart as we were. The new knowledge argument says basically, get this, if Paul and Jesus knew what we knew, Paul and Jesus would believe what we believed. If Paul and Jesus knew what we knew, they would have been enlightened the way we're enlightened. That's the new knowledge argument. Matthew Vines wrote a book called God and the Gay Christian, um, and he, he's not a New Testament scholar, but he's the most popular advocate of this view. You'll find a lot of people making this argument on, online. What you, who you won't find making this argument are New Testament scholars. Even affirming New Testament scholars don't make this argument. They make the second argument, which is called the antiquated morality argument. This argument basically agrees with the historic view. This argument says, yes, the Bible prohibits homosexual practices, New Testament and Old Testament. This view says, yeah, the, old, the ancient world knew about orientation. It agrees that Jesus would have thought that the male-female requirement for marriage was important, foundational. However, they simply say, we disagree with the Bible. We disagree with Paul. We disagree with Jesus. We don't believe in biblical authority. In other words, we know what the Bible teaches, but we don't have to do what the Bible says. And it's an honest reading. So most affirming scholars hold this view. But most scholars who are, who are like New Testament scholars who have a, a high view of biblical authority and they say, if the Bible says it, we have to do it, then they're, they hold the historic view. So... So that's the antiquated morality argument. Um, almost out of time. Are there any reasons other than the Bible to oppose homosexual practices? Uh, yes, there's what we call natural law arguments. You can Google those. I won't get into them now. Can people's orientation change over time? Next slide. That's a fascinating question because there's a lot of pushback against what's called conversion therapy. There's a dark history around it. Pray the gay away is what some people colloquial call it. It's kind of a prosperity gospel for orientation. If you just believe in Jesus enough, he'll change your desires. Um, what's interesting, though, is the research says some people's orientation does change. Some people change what they fantasize about, and it changes what they fixate on, and it changes what they're attracted to. Um, women even more than men. You know, women are far more likely to be bisexual than men, and men are far more likely to either be straight or same-sex attracted. But women are more fluid than men. They're more likely to change their orientation over time. But some men, um, Ricky Shillette, some of you guys know Ricky, who leads Living Hope Ministry across the street. Ricky's story is he came out of the gay lifestyle. He said, I never thought I could be attracted to women. God saved me. But after getting to know one woman, I realized I could be attracted to her. I am attracted to her. So he married Merlinda. They were married over 20 years. And he said, I'm not attracted to women, but I am attracted to that woman. And he was able to have a satisfying long-term... Now, not every same-sex attracted person gets that experience, but some do. Um, and then last slide... I think we got the practical. These are on the bottom of your handout. Practically, what should we do about all this? One is we treat gay friends the same way we treat all of our friends. 
They don't have cooties. Be their friend. Share your life with them. Share Jesus with them. Make it about Jesus, not sexuality. Make Jesus the most important issue. Don't seek conflict. Do everything you can to avoid debating these topics. Try to point them to Christ. But if they press you, share what you believe. We can't be people who cave on truth, but we also can't be people who beat people down with the truth. You will be called bigoted unless you reject Jesus' teaching on sexuality. Like, you're going to get some tension if you stand for truth on this one. Um, A good thing to keep in mind is even if your friends feel really passionately about a topic, it doesn't make their view true. Truth makes their view true. Even if they say really loudly that you're a bad person, it doesn't make you a bad person. And then the last slide, what do we do with our fellow believers who are same-sex attracted? This might be some of you in the room. God loves you. We love you. The church has a place for you. Support our friends like that. Ask them to support us because they have valuable things to offer the church. Let's live in community with each other. They're people to be loved. And we also acknowledge for them that for some of them, denying themselves, picking up their cross and following Jesus will have some unique challenges. So we want to be extra supportive and sensitive to those challenges. And if that's you, God loves you. Church is there for you. So I'm done. We're three minutes over time. I'm going to say a prayer, and I'll be happy. We'll gather up over here and do an evangelism in a second, but if you want to do a question or two, I'll stand up here and take questions for a few minutes. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to talk about sensitive but so pressing, so important issues. God, I pray that you'd both help us to cling to, celebrate, cherish your love for us and your love for people, but also stand on your truth and not compromise it because people and the culture pressure us to do that. God, help us to be good missionaries, not culture warriors who go out to win arguments. Help us to win souls to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you, when you save us, you change everything about us. We need you. God, we pray for evangelism on campus in a minute, that you'd put us right in touch with people who you want us to talk with. In Christ's name we pray, amen.